Um, continue from last week. We were covering Nehemiah. We did chapter 1 and chapter 2. And we're going to flip over to chapter 3. And we're going to just uh, read uh, some verses. And then we'll, we'll continue to, uh, to discuss. Uh, then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brothers, the priest, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and set it its door. They consecrated as far as the tower of the hundred, as far as the tower of Hananel, and next to him the man of Jericho built, and next to them. Zakur, the son of Imri, built. The sons of Hasena built the fish gate. They laid its beam and set its doors, its bolts, and its bars. Next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakoz, repaired. And next to them, Meshalam, the sons of Bar uh, Barakiah, son of Meshezabel repaired, and next to them Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired, and next to them Tekoiat uh, repaired. But theirs, nobles, would not stoop to serve their lord. Um, Joiada, the son of Paset, and Meshalam, the sons of uh, Besodea, Repair the gates of uh, Yeshana. They laid its beams and set its doors and its bolts and its bars. The next to them repaired Melatiah, the Gibeonite, and Jadon, the Marana, uh, Marathite, the men of Gibeon, and the Mizpah, and seat of the governor of the province beyond the river. Next to them, Uziel, the son of uh, Harhiah, Goldsmith repaired. Next to him, Hanania, one of the perf uh, perfumers, repaired, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad walls. Next to them, uh, Rephiah, the son of Hur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired. Next to them, Zediah, the son of Haramath, uh, repaired opposite of his house. The next to him, Hatush, the son of uh, Hasha, Hasha Neya, repaired. Uh, Melkaja, the son of Harim, and Hashub, the son of Pahat Moab, repaired another sections of the Tower of Oven. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halo, Ash, Halohesh, rulers of Half of the district of Jerusalem repaired, he and his daughters. Okay, so let's just take a look at a few things here. So they started to, uh, to repair the, uh, the walls of uh, Jer Jerusalem. And as it starts in chapter 3, then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brother, the priest, and they built the sheep gate. So there are multiple gates that we see here. Uh, let's just take a look at the um, the map again, which I showed you last week. When you look at the uh, the map here, this is the walls, and this is the the temple. So when you look at the walls around. The temple area, you'll see there are there's door this 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 there's like many uh the doors and the gates around the walls here. So you'll see there's a sheep gate, which is what we just saw from chapter three. And uh, Elia shipped the high priest arose up with the brothers and the priest that they built the sheep gate. So they repair this particular gate in this area. Since uh, Eliashib is the high priest, you know, they're living very close to the temple side. So they tried to just, uh, you know, uh, repair the gate 
around where they live. And then、um, it says they consecrated and set its doors, and consecrated as far as Tower of a Hundred, as far as the Tower of Hananel. So when you look at here, the Tower of Hananel is right here. So they repair from this Sheep Gate all the way to Hananel's Tower. So right here. So they this these are the area. Where the、uh, um, Elia ship、uh, repaired、um, with his brothers and so forth, and then verse two says, "And next to him, men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zakkur the son of Imri built. The son of Hasana built the fish gate. So you will see fish gate right here." So since the Elia ship repaired a gate from the sheep gate over all the way over to this the tower of Hananel, and、uh, the next person started to just repair this area, which is the fish gate. So they go around each of the area, but what you will find here is they're repairing、um, the area or the walls that are close to where they live.、Um, So,、uh, Hasena built the fish gate, and they laid its beams, and it sets its doors, and its bolts, and its bars. And next to them,、uh, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, son of Hakoz, repaired. And next to them, Mashalam, the son of Barakiah, son of、uh, Meshazabel, repaired. And next to them, Zadok, the son of Bana, repaired. And next to them. Tekoi,、uh, Tekoi, repaired, but their noble would not stood to serve their lord. So what we will see is most of a,、uh, um, just regular people, they actually participated in repairing the walls, but there are many nobles. And the rich people did not participate to repair the the walls, so you will see there is a separation between the some rich and noble people who does not really want to participate versus the people who are willing to really just to repair the wall. And Jo、uh, Joida, the son of、uh, Paset, and Meshalam, the son of Um, Besodeya repaired the gate of、uh, Yeshan Yeshana. They laid its beam and it set its door and its bolts and the bar. And next to them repaired Mel、uh, Mel Melatia, the Gibeonites,、um, and Jadon, the Meronothites, the men of、uh, Gibeon and of Mizpah. The seat of a governor of the province beyond the river. Um. One of the things that I want to just talk about here is、um, verse seven says, "Next to them repaired a Melat Melatia and Gibonite and Jadon the." Uh, Meronothite, the men of Gibeon, and Mizpah.、Uh, I want to discuss about these people who repaired this、um, this wall.、Um, this the gate of Yeshana,、um, which is the old gate. So right here. On this, on the upper left side, you will see the、uh, old gate, this、uh, Jeshana gate right here, to the left. And this whole walls, as you can see here, is entirely just for the、uh, wall of、uh, Jerusalem. But what's interesting here is the people. Who's repairing this particular the old gate or 
Jeshana gate is Gibeonite. So I want to discuss a little bit on this one. So I'm going to ask you this. When you think of a people of Gibeonites, what comes to your mind? What do you remember about the Gibeonite? Who are they? Do you know any um, things that comes to your mind? Who is the Gibeonite? Does anyone remember? Um, Gibeonite, I think, I think if I recall back in the time of Joshua, they were the people who went to visit Joshua and like, That is absolutely correct. When we go back to the, the book of Joshua, let's go to the uh, book of Joshua, chapter 9. Joshua, chapter 9. Let's just uh, take a look at as soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and in the lowland all along the coast of a great sea towards the Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorites, the Canaanites, and Perizzites, Hevites, and the Jebusites heard of this. They gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. But when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai. They, on their part, acted on cunning and went and made ready provisions and took worn-out sacks for their donkeys and wineskins worn out and torn the mended, with worn-out patched sandals on their feet and worn-out clothes, and all their provisions were dried and crumbled, crumbled. And they went to Joshua in the camp at Gilgar, and said to him and to the men of Israel, We have come from a distant country, so now make a covenant with us. But the men of Israel said to the Hebites, Perhaps you live alone among us. Then how can we make a covenant with you. And they said to Joshua, We are your servants. And Joshua said to them, Who are you? And where do you come from? They said to him, From a very distant country your servants have come because of the name of the Lord your God, for we have heard a report of him and all that he did in Egypt and all that he did to the Two kings of Amorites who were be, uh, beyond the Jordan, and Shihon, the king of Hezbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, who lived in uh, Ashtaroth. So our elders and all the inhabitants in our country said to us, Take provisions in your hand for the journey and go to Meet them and say to them, We are your servants. Come now and make a covenant with us. Here is our bread. It was still warm, and when we took it from our house as our food for the journey on the day we set out to come to you, but now, behold, it is dry and crumbly. These wineskins were new when we filled them, and behold, they have burst. And these garments and sandals of our are worn out from the very long journey. So the men took some of their provision, but did not ask counsel from the Lord. And Joshua made a peace with them and made a covenant with them to let them live. And the leaders of the congregations swore to them. So out of a many people 
lived in the land of uh, Canaan. And God told him, once you actually cross the river, uh, the Jordan River, you need to really just fight against them and drive them all out. And that was the order that God told them to Joshua and Israel. But after they crossed Jordan and they literally destroyed the, um, the Jericho, and many of the people were fear, but at the same time, they tried to just to, you know, make ally together, try to fight against uh, the Israelites. And while everybody's, the people, the inhabitants of Canaan, gather together to fight against Israel, Gibeonites, on the other hand, they changed their, uh, uh, their positions and they actually came to uh, make a, a covenant with Joshua and Israelites. And they literally, um, the lie to Joshua and, and presented to them as if they came from a long, far uh, distance country. But they came from the literally just next uh, town from where they were camping. And obviously, Joshua and the elders of Israel, without knowing um, they are the, the Gibeonites, they made a covenant. So according to the scriptures said, neither Joshua or the elder did not ask the Lord what, sh what, he what, they, what they should do, but rather asking God, but they just made a covenant with them. So, while Gibeonites made a covenant, the rest of the, uh, the Canaanites, which we listed out in um, chapter 9, verse 1, there are many people, Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Petzarites, Hebites, and Jebusites, and all of these people gathered to fight against the Joshua and Israel. Gibeonite is the only people who came to Joshua, and they literally just wanted to make a covenant with them. And when you actually look at the uh, chapter 10, um, let's take a look at chapter 10, verse 1 and on. As soon as Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had captured Ai and, um, and had a devoted to uh, devoted it to constructions and doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its kings and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made a peace with Israel and were among them. He feared greatly because the Gibeon was a great city like one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai and all its mans were warriors. According to the scriptures, the Gibeonites are not the weak people. They're the warrior, and the Gibeon is a lawyer cities among all other cities in Canaan. Even though they are a warrior and they're the people of royal people, they came to Joshua and made a covenant with them. And all the allied who came together to fight against the Joshua in Israel, they're literally just frightened and the Gibeonites gave themselves up and made a covenant with Joshua. So what they did was they tried to just bring together with all the ally and try to destroy uh, to, to fight against Gibeon. So let's take a look at the um, uh, verse 3 and on. So Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hohan, the king of Hebron, the Piram, king of Jarmuth, and Zapia, king of Lachish, and Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me, and let us strike Gibeon. For it is it has made a peace with Joshua and with the people of Israel. Then the five kings of the Amorites, king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, 
gather their forces and went up with all their armies and encamped against Gibeon and made a war against it. Because all the allied in the Canaanites come together, they were going to fight against uh, Joshua and Israel. But when they heard the news that Gibeon reached out to Joshua and made a covenant, they were very upset and they were mad. And instead of actually hitting the uh, Joshua and Israel, they decide to hit the Gibeonite first because they were just like upset. You're a betrayer. So we're going to attack you. We're going to destroy you before we are going to just fight against Joshua and in Israel. When the Gibeonite heard the news, they literally just came to, um, to, uh, to Joshua. So let's just read, all, read a little more, starting from verse 6. And the men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp in Gilgar, saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of Amorites who dwell in the hill country are gathered against us. So Joshua went up from Gilgar, he and all the people of a war with them, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not fear them, for I have given them into your hands. Not a man of them shall stand before you. So Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched up all night from Gilgar. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck them with the great blow at Gibeon, and chased them by the ways of the ascent of Beth Horon, and struck them as far as Azeka and um, Mekeda. And as they fled before Israel, while they were going down the as, uh, ascent of Beth Horon, the Lord threw them uh, threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azeka, and they died. There were more who died because of the hailstones and the sons of Israel killed with the sword. At the time of Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, uh, stand still at Gibeon at, and moon in the valley of uh, Aijalon, and the sun and uh, and the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about the whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord of Fout for Israel. So Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp at Gilgar. While I was actually just uh, explaining about the Joshua back in the time, I'd have had many um, miraculous signs that we ever um, observed in the Bible. Especially when... Moses actually took the Israel out of Egypt. God has shown so many different miracles that no one ever seen. And out of entire miracles or all the signs that we have seen in entire Old Testament, there is no miracles like this ever. This is the biggest Miracles that happen. We have seen that God actually separated the the Red Seas, right? That was amazing stories that God had performed. How could the, the sea could be split into half? I mean, that's just unbelievable miracle God actually showed to the uh, Israel as well as uh, the Egyptians. And we have also seen that God actually brought the uh, fire from heaven like Elijah did and burned the altar. And out of the many miracles we have seen, we never seen literally suns 
and moon stop. This kind of miracles never happen in the past or in the future. How could sun and moon stop? Is it possible? That's if you actually ask the scientists, can moon and sun stop? Everyone's going to say that's impossible. And as we read the story, people say, "Oh, okay, God stopped in uh, the sun and moon. No big deal." We think it's no big deal, but when you actually just think about this, this miracle is just like impossible miracle. God stopped the sun and moon to spin. To do what? Why did God actually stop the sun and moon? What's the purpose? To destroy all these uh, people went up to destroy the Gibeonite. The people who came up to destroy the Gibeonite, God wanted to really just remove them. And that's the reason why God stopped the moon and sun. To protect Gibeonite. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, God told Moses as well as Joshua to remove every uh, tribes who live in Canaan. That includes Gibeonites. They're supposed to be removed. That they're supposed to be killed. And Joshua, an elder, did not even ask the Lord or consulted with Lord what they should do before they make the covenant. But they didn't. Even though Joshua, an elder, made a covenant with Gibeonite without even asking the Lord, God literally accepted and God actually just protected the Gibeonites, you know, showing that God is really just making it very sure that this covenant is valid. Even Joshua and the elder did not consult with the Lord. God stopped the sun and moon to protect the Gibeonites. It's an amazing story. And every time I read this story, it just gives me something. Why did God do this? God initially told Moses and Joshua to remove all the tribes of Canaan. Why did God actually want to protect the Gibeonite? Now, this is very important, right? Where we, really, where we really need to understand as we read the Bible is... Father's heart. Where is our Father's heart? If you don't understand our Father's heart, you will never going to understand the Bible. As I mentioned, Bible as a whole talks about love. If we summarize the entire Bible as the one word, that will be love. Then what love are we talking about? If you don't understand love, you don't understand Bible. Um, let's just take a look at uh, some of the places where we just read before. Let's just go to uh, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter um, eighteen. Ezekiel chapter eighteen.
Let's read from verse 19. Yet you say, why should not the Son suffer for the iniquity of the Father, when the Son has done what is just and right, and has been careful to observe all the statues, he shall surely live. The soul whose sins shall die, the Son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the fathers, nor the fathers suffer for the iniquity of the sons. The righteousness of the right uh, of the righteous sh uh, shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins, and he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declared the Lord God, and not father, uh, not rather that he should turn from his way and live? But when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? None of the righteous deed that he has done shall be remembered, for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, for them he shall die. This particular sections that we just read from Ezekiel give us good understanding of God's heart. What he says here is verse 21, which is the very, very important for all of us to remember. This is a father's heart. But if the wicked person turns away from all his sins and he has a committed and keeps all his statue and does what is just and right, he shall surely live and she shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. And for the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declared the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? Verse 23 literally sums it up of everything what we need to learn from our Bible. This is critically important for us to remember. God's heart. What is God's heart? I'm going to just give you an example. Let's say there is a, some criminals. There are some criminals. That criminal must have their parents. From the people's perspective, that criminal is the person who should be punished and who deserve to be, you know, serve their term for what they have committed. We all look at that person who committed criminal, the crime. We look at them as a bad guy. All of us sees that way. Even though everyone sees that person who committed crime is a bad person. And to his parents, to his mother, to his father, they're still a lovely person to their family. They, the family still love them. Of course, there are family that are not like that. Imagine... If our child has committed crime, will you abandon your child? Will you stop loving him because he committed crime? For us, as a parent, we still love our child. Even though per my child has committed a crime, I still love my child. If you understand that heart, that you will understand God's heart. 
God's heart is not to destroy people, and God is not happy that people to be punished and perish. That is not the God's heart. God's heart is even wicked person to turn around and repent and be live. That's the God's heart. Let's just take this into Gibeonites. Gibeonites supposed to be removed and they literally be killed. However, when they come to Joshua, they were able to spare their lives. Who is Joshua? Joshua literally is the name of a Jesus. I'm going to tell you this. Am I deserve to live? No, I don't. I don't deserve to live. I'm not a righteous person. I'm not better than other people. Did I do anything good to be saved? No, I didn't. Do I deserve to be saved? No, not at all. Did you do anything good to deserve to be saved? No, you don't. So what did we do? We repent and believed in Jesus Christ. That's all we did. Not because we're righteous. We're still a sinner. I'm no different than anyone else. I don't deserve to be saved. But the difference is, I came to Jesus. I repent for my sins, and I believed in Jesus Christ who saves me. What is the difference between the Gibeonites? Supposed to be removed and killed, but they came to Joshua and made a covenant with Joshua. And God stopped the suns and moon to protect them. That is the same story. Does God want to spare the Gibeonites? Yes, he does. That is the God's heart. But let's just go a little deeper than that. Okay, so we know the story of the Gibeonites came to Joshua, made a covenant, and God literally stopped sun and moon to protect them. Okay, great story. We know this story. What else? What else do we know about the Gibeonites? Do we know anything else? Any other story? Saul, King Saul, literally tried to remove the Kibionites. Right? So, this is why God actually tried to bring disaster upon Israel. And they realized Saul was trying to remove the Kibionites, which God wanted to protect them. But Saul wanted to remove them. So God actually punished Saul's and his family for that reason. So God wanted to protect the Gibeonites. Okay, that's the second story. What else? I want you to think about this.
You know the story of uh, Solomon. Solomon prayed to the Lord, and God granted a lot of stuff to Solomon, right? Where did he pray? Hmm? Where did he pray? Let's go to um, um, First Chronicle. Let's go to First Chronicle. Actually, you know what? Let's do to go to not the first chronicle. Let's go to first, uh, first king. I'm sorry, first king. First king chapter three. First king chapter three. We're going to read from verse two. The people were sacrificing at the high places. However, because of no house had yet been built for the name of the Lord, Solomon loved the Lord walking in the statue of David his father. Only he sacrificed and made offering at the high place. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offering on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. Where did Solomon give sacrifice? Gibeon. Gibeon. That's when God appeared to Solomon and granted him. And that's the place where Solomon gave the thousand offerings to the Lord. That was the Gibeon. This is the place where God actually just granted Solomon's wish. And this is important. Why is it important? How much God cares for Gibeon and Gibeonite. Out of the many tribes of the Canaanites, Gibeonites has been taken care of by God. Why? Because they came to Joshua and made a covenant with Israel. And God literally granted their wishes and saved them, protected them throughout the Bible. Why am I actually going through all this story of Gibeonites and Gibeon? Because they're the one who participated in rebuilding the walls. Are there Israelites? No, they're not Israelites. Even though they're not Israelites, they're participating rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Why would all these people participate in rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem? Only Jewish people, only the Israelites supposed to really rebuild the, temp the, the walls. But Gibeonites was participating, repairing the old gates. As if 
They're a part of Israel. So when you look at the entire Old Testament, the Gibeonites are very special people. Even though they're not Jews, even though they're not Israel, they have been protected. They've been part of it. They were participating, rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Should we care? Yes, we should care. Why? Because that is a literally story of our church. Who are we? Are we Israel? No, we're not Israel. We're literally pagan. We're Gentiles. Even though we're Gentiles, God made all the covenant with Israel, not with Gentiles. All the promises God had made, it's got nothing to do with the Gentiles. But how do we accept those promises God made to Israel? It is accepted as the promise that he made with us. Why? Because we are like Gibeonites. We became Israel by believing in Jesus Christ. We're spiritual Israel. And we literally inherit all the promises God made to Israel. We accepted it as ours. This is why Gibeonites are very important. And how much God really cared for them. That means how much God cares for us. Are we participated in God's work? Yes, we do. Why? Because we're a spiritual Israel. And this is very imp important and interesting things to read as we just learned as Nehemiah. Why? Because even though it's very slight and very little things in the Bible, it's important for us to remember what God has done to Gibeonites. So coming back to Nehemiah, we're going to read from verse 13. Hanun and inhabitants of Zanoa repaired the valley gate. They rebuilt it and set its doors its bolts and its bars and repaired a thousand cubits of the walls as far as the dung gate. Malkija, the son of Rechahab, uh, rulers of district of Beth uh, Hakarem, repaired a dung gate. He rebuilt it and set its door and its bolt and its bars. Okay. So, Verse 14 says, Mel uh, Melchijah, the son of uh, Rechab, the ruler of district of Beth Hakarim, or Perda Dungate. Now, let's take a look at this for a moment. Rechab. Who is Rechab? Does anyone know who Rechab is? Nobody, nobody knows? We have actually discussed about this a long time ago when we were learning. You don't remember any of it? Let's just go to Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35. 
We're going to read from verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Go to the house of Rechabites and speak with them and bring them to the house of the Lord into one of the chambers. Then offer them wine to drink. So I took uh, Jazai, Z- Jazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of uh, Habaz, Habazinia, and his brothers, and all his sons, and the whole house of Rechabites. I brought them to the house of the Lord into the chamber of the son of Hanan, the son of uh, Igdalia, a man of God, which was near the chamber of officials, ab- above the chamber of Maseiah, the son of Shalom, keepers of threshold. Then I set before the Rechabites pitchers full of wines and cups, and I said to them, Drink wine. But they answered, We will drink no wine, for Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us. You shall not drink wine, neither you nor your sons forever. You shall not build a house, you shall not sow seed, you shall not plant or have a vineyard, but you shall live in tents in all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. We have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in our in, in all that he commanded us to drink no wine all our days, ourselves, our wives, our sons, or our daughters, and not to build houses to dwell in. We have no vineyard or field or seed, but we have lived in tents and have obeyed and done all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, he said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of army of the Chardians and army of the Syrians. So we are living in Jerusalem. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instructions and listen to my words, declared the Lord, the, commandment, uh, the command that Jonadab, the son of Rechab, gave to his sons to drink no wine, has been kept, and they drink none to this day. For they have obeyed their father's command. I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened to me. I have sent to you all my servants and prophets, sending them persistently, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil ways and amend your deeds, and do not go after other gods to serve them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to you and your fathers. But you did not incline your ears or listen to me. The sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have kept the command that their father gave them. But these people has not obeyed me. Therefore, though, says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I am bringing upon Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disasters that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken to them, and they have not listened. I have called to them, and they have not answered. But to the house of Rechabite, Jeremiah said, that Though says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because you have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab your father, and kept his precepts, and done all that he commanded you. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall never lack a man to stand before me. When God was actually just trying to explain to the Israelites, and God picked the Rechabites, the sons of Rechab, Jonadab, told his descendants and saying, do not drink wine, because if you drink wine, you will do something 
silly and the Israelites may destroy us. So, so do not drink, do not seed, do not bring tent, don't do any of those to survive. And God was literally telling Jeremiah, listen, Jonadab, which is the sons of Rechab, told his descendants not to do this, and Rechabites has been kept all the stuff that Jonadab told his descendants. They're keeping the command that Jonadab told his descendants, and Rechabites been keeping all his commandments. What about you, Israel? Me as God told you to keep my statue and my commandment. None of you listen to me. None of you follow what I say. While Rechabites follow everything what Jonadab told them to do. God was comparing Rechabite versus Israel. And Rechabite became examples. Listening and keeping the covenants of Jonathan. And at the end, God said, you will stand before me for what you have done because you have kept your uh, ancestors, Jonathan's. They were not following God's commitment, but still God respected them. And God said, you will stand before me. Very similar to the story of Gibeonite. Rechabite just kept his ancestors' commandment. God actually endorsed them. And when you read the story of Nehemiah, this son of Rechab is participating, restoring this the wall of Jerusalem. These are the two groups of people who are not Israelites, but participate in restoring the walls of Jerusalem. And I think this is important for us to remember. Even though we're not Israel, we believe in Jesus Christ, we became a sons of Abraham. And we inherited all the blessings that God actually gave to Abraham. And we as a church are blessed. Gibeonites, Rechabites, same thing. And they participated in God's work. Coming back to Nehemiah, verse 15. And Shalom, the son of Akol, Hose, the ruler of the district of Mizpah, repaired the fountain gate. He rebuilt it and covered it and set its door, its bolts and its bars, and he built the walls of the pool of Shelah, of the king's garden as far as the stairs that go down from the city of David. After him, Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, rulers of half the district of Beth Zerd, repaired to the point opposite the tombs of David as far as artif uh, artifi uh, artificial pools, as far as the house of the mighty man's after him, the Levites repaired Rehum, the son of Bani, next to him, uh, Hashabiah, rulers of half of uh, half the district of uh, Kela, repaired for his district. After him, their brothers repaired ba, uh, Bavaya, the sons of their brothers, and uh, uh, Hen. Uh, Hanadad, rulers of half the district of Akela. Next to him, 
Ezer, the son of Joshua, the ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the Sent, uh, to the Emery of the uh, Butress. After him, Baruch, the son of uh, Zabai, repaired other side, other sections of the uh, Butress to the doors of the uh, house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakoz, repaired another section from the doors of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. After him, the priest, the man of the surrounding area, repaired after them. Benjamin and uh, Hashub repaired opposite their house. After them, Azariah, Azariah, uh, Azariah the son of Asaiah, son of uh, Anat Ananiah, repaired besides his own house. After him, um, Binui, the son of Hanadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and the corner. Palar, the son of Uzziah, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower, projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. After him, Pediah, the son of Parosh, and the temple servant living on Opel, repaired to the point opposite the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. After him, the Takoyet repaired another section opposite the great projection, a projecting tower as far as the wall of Opel. Above the house, uh, uh, above the horse gate, the priest repaired each one opposite his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Emer, repaired opposite his own house. After him, uh, Sh Shemaiah, the son of Shekaniah, keeper of the east gate, repaired. After him, Hananiah, son of Shalmiah, and Hanun, the sixth son of Zalapha, Azalaf repaired another sections after him. Meshulam, the son of uh, Barakiah, repaired opposite his chamber after him. Uh, Malkijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and the merchant opposite the uh, muster gate and the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate and the goldsmith and the merchants repaired. So many of the people participating in repair, repairing the, the walls of the Jerusalem. But most of them, as you can see here, they literally repair the walls that are close to their house. So they started from the opposite from their house where they lived. And wherever the closest the wall sections is dead. It, that that's the area they focus on rebuilding those uh, the broken walls. This basically tells us, you know, from where we stand, when we actually work on God's work, we don't look for a far away somewhere, but we start from wherever we're close to, starting from where I can reach people that I can reach is opposite from my own house. The broken walls, that's where we, re, we need to repair first before we can get to other places or, or places where uh, we need to go far away. This is something that we need to keep in mind. So when we jump over to uh, chapter 4, Now, when Sambalat heard that we were building the walls, he was angry and great, greatly enraged, and he jeered at Jews, and he said in the presence of his brothers and the army of Samaria, What are these feeble of Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will, it, will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rub, rubbish and burn the ones, uh, on, ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite 
was beside him, and he said, "Yes, what they are building. If a fox goes up on it, up on it, he will break down their stone walls. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back, dear taunt on dear heads, and give them up to to be plundered in the land where they are cap、uh, captives. Do not cover their guilt, and let." Not their sins be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. So he, we build the walls, and all the walls was joined together to half its height, and the people had the mind to work. So there are two peoples that we can see here. One is Sambalat. Sambalat is Israelites, is Jew, and he's the one who's going against to rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, even though he's Israel. He doesn't want to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, and what he said is, "What are these feeble Jews doing?" Feeble Jew. Even though he himself is Jew, he literally calls his own people feeble Jews, as if they cannot do anything. They are powerless, and they're helpless, as if they can build the walls. And verse three says. Tobia, the Ammonite, was beside him, and he said, "Yes, what they are building. If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone walls." So, Tobia, which is Ammonite, he's not Jews, so he joined together with Sambalat, and they're literally just making fun of the people rebuilding the walls. They're saying if the fox goes up on the walls and just a little touch it, then it's gonna crumble down. And they're just making the spies. This is something that we need to keep in mind. Sambalat is Jew, and Tobia is Ammonite. So one is Jew, one is not. All the Jews come together, trying to restore the wall of Jerusalem, which is God's city. But there are a group of people, and two people representing those opposite side, which is Sambalat and this Tobia, is against the God's work. When you look at the end of our time, we, as a church and believer of Jesus Christ, we come together. We try to do God's work. While we're trying to do God's work as a believer, there is a groups of people who will go against those believers. Interestingly, at the end time, there are groups of people who go against the believer. Do you know who they are? They are people who used to. Be called as church, but betrayed Jesus. The way it describes in the Revelations, when you go to Revelation for a moment, Let's go to Revelations chapter seventeen.
Then one of the seven angels who, who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality and with the wines of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk and carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blef uh, blasphemous names and it had the seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purples and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of a prostitute of earth, abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and blood of the uh, martyrs of Jesus. This prostitute, as I mentioned, the woman in Old Testament represent Israel. And New Testament, women represent the church. But this woman became a prostitute. What does that mean? That means it used to be called a church. But they're the one who betrayed a church. And they're the one on the leading edge, the persecuting the true believers. Just like the Sambalat. Sambalat is the Jews. And Jewish people come together rebuilding the walls. And Sambalat, they're joined together with Tobiah, which is non-Israelites. They come together and try to persecute the people of God. And it's happening at the end as well. The church it used to be church, but it's no longer a church. What's the difference between the church, but it's no longer a church? You have to see the difference between the true believers and not. There are many places we call the church. Just because they come to church, just because they know who Jesus is, does not mean they are a believer of Jesus Christ. There are people who come to church to become a good people, but not a believer of Jesus Christ. Not just knowing who Jesus is, what he has done, but believe who he is, what he has done. So there are people who know Jesus versus who believe in Jesus Christ. There are big difference. No matter what they call, the place they gather, they may call a church. They may have a cross on the top of their building. Does not make the believer of a Jesus Christ. Believer of a Christ is truly who believe in Jesus and receive the Holy Spirit. Those are the true believers. Not just coming to church building. And same thing with the story of Nehemiah. Sambalat and Tobiah. Even though Sambalat was part of the Israelites. And he go, up, go against the people who's restoring the wall. Coming back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, is a saint. he was praying to the Lord. Instead of he's trying to fight against uh, Sambalat and Tobiah, instead, he prayed to the Lord. And the way he prayed is in verse 4 and on. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn back their town on their own head and give them up to be plundered in the land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sights, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence 
of the builders. So we built the walls, and all the wall was joined together to its half its height, for the people had the mind to work. The people who mind to rebuild the walls, God is with them. But for those people who followed Sambalat and Tobia, and he's praying, don't let them be in peace. Verse 7 says, But when Sambalat and Tobia and the Arabs and the Ammonites and Eshdodite heard that the repair of the wall of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry and they, are, uh, they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause the confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. In Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens of burden is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the walls. And our enemies said, they will not know or will still be, we come along them and kill them and stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, You must return to us. So in the lowest part of the space behind the walls, in open places, I stations the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked, and, and I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers and your sons and daughters and your wives and your homes. So what happened is, there are many people in the city who joined together with Sambalat and Tobia. But at the same time, there are people who want to restore the walls of Jerusalem. When they do that, Nehemiah said, fight against them. Bring the bowls, sword, and arrow. So they prepared to fight against those people who are trying to stop their work. Now the question is this. Does God want to restore this wall of Jerusalem? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He wants Israel to restore the walls of Jerusalem. But why didn't God help them? Why did God allow the Sambalat and Tobia and the groups of people go against the Israel to restore the wall of Jerusalem? Let's go back to the story that we have read from Ezra. When they came back from Babylon, they were trying to rebuild the temple. When they were trying to rebuild the temple, that was God's plan and that's God's will. But when they came back and built their foundations, was there groups of people who were trying to stop their work? The people who lived there trying to stop Israel to rebuild the temple. So they actually sent a letter to Persia to try to stop their work. So they up against the groups of people who's trying to stop rebuilding the temple. So the temple build stopped for 16 years. Even though God wanted to rebuild the temple, they up, up against the resistance from the people who live there. Question is, if God's will is to restore the temple, why did God allow the people to go up against the people who try to rebuild the temple? This is the part that we need to understand. When we try to do God's work, we will always find 
groups of people trying to fight against us. Some are not just outside of the church. Some are within the church. Some are among us. They will try to stop us. They will give us a trouble. And we question ourselves, is this God's will to do what we need to do? Absolutely. But we will find the resistance, even though it's God's will. Don't ever think that just because God wants us to do certain work does not mean it's going to go very easy. We will find the resistance. Sometimes we are the resistance is so strong that we question ourselves, is this God's will to do this? But we have to know and we need to be distinguished if this is God's will. If you know for sure if it is God's will, then we have to continue to do our part. They were getting ready to fight against this group of people who go up against the people who try to rebuild the, temp, uh, the, the walls of the Jerusalem. We have to do what we have to do. So the wall belongs to God. But who needs to fight? Joshua need to really go out and fight against the uh, uh, Amorites. We have to do our part. We need to really just uh, bring the swords and arrows, and we have to get ready to fight against them, even though God is with us. So when you look at the verse 13 says, So in the lowest part of the space behind the walls in open places, I stations the people by their clans with their sword and their spears and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials, to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard it, it was unknown to us, and the God had frustrated their plans. We will return to the walls, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on constructions, and half the hell. The spears held bows and coats of mail, and the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah, they uh, who were building on the walls. Those who carried a burden who were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapons with the others, and each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside, him, beside me, and I sat to the nobles and the officials and to the rest of the people, worked is great and widely um, spread, and we separated on the walls afar uh, from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us, there our God will fight for us. So we labored at the work, and half of them held the spears from the break of dawn until the stars came out. I also said to the people at them, Let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be guard for us by night and may labor by day. So neighbor I nor my brothers, nor my servant, nor the man of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes, each kept his weapons at right hand. Uh, at his right hand. So literally, one hand, they're working to rebuild the temples, the other hand, they're holding the weapons. Always ready to fight against the people who come and resist. They did this from the morning till night. They did their part. 
Even though they believe that the war is on God, God will actually fight for them. But still, they're the one who actually carry the weapons on one side and one hand to fight against them. Chapter 5 Now there arose a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish brothers, for there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters we are many, so let us get grain, that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, We are uh, mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain, our um because of the famine. And there were those who said, who have borrowed the money for the king's tax on, feel, uh, on our fields and our vineyard. Now our fret, uh, flesh is as the flesh of our brothers. Our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it. Four other mans have our field and our vineyard. This actually, look at exactly the situations they're in. What is happening there? Famine came down on them. I want you to think about this for a moment. If God wants to rebuild the walls of a Jerusalem, Shouldn't God really just to bless them and be, you know, have abundant food and, you know, being good? Why God brings the famine on them? They're barely trying to just to rebuild the walls and fighting against the, the people who's trying to just to stop their work. Shouldn't God bless Israel to be abundant and full of grains? But why did God bring the famines to them? Why make things even worse? When famine comes down, when there is no grain, there's no place to work, and their children's been sold, why doesn't God help them? I want you to think about this for a moment. When God called Abram out of Ur, when he reached to Canaan, what did he find? Land of milk and honey. <laughs> what he found was a famine. Yeah. And he says the severe famine was on the land. There's nothing to do. And there's no grain to buy. So what did Abraham do? He went down to Egypt to find grains. Because the Canaan, there's, there's no food for his families or for his animals. So he had no choice. He had to go down to Egypt. But when he go down to the Egypt, God was not pleased. This is the question we always ask ourselves. If this is God's will, why doesn't he bless us? Why doesn't he allow the full of grains, just like what you said, the milk and honey? Why doesn't he, why doesn't God allow Abraham to have all these blessings? If God wants to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, why doesn't God bless them, give them enough money, and God bless them to have more grains why making worse from our perspective it makes no sense why God makes us more difficult to do the work and this is the things that most people don't understand When things go well, they thank the Lord. Lord, thank you for everything that you provided to us. Great. Everything is going well. When things, go, things don't go right, they start to complain. 
Why me? Why don't you bless me? I have done all this work for you. How come you are doing this to me? But what you don't understand is this. Do you believe in Jesus Christ and thank the Lord because God blessed you all the time? Because God grants you everything what you ask for? Is that why you believe in Jesus Christ and why you thank the Lord? If that's what you believe, I don't think you're a good believer. I'm not even sure whether you're a true believer. God always puts us in difficult situation. Why? So that we can truly rely on Him. If we have a something, we will not cry out. If we are abundantly blessed, we will not seek Him. When is the time that we seek the Lord? When things don't go right, that's when we seek the Lord. Even church at the end time, God made the Antichrist and the follower of the Antichrist and betray the church to persecute the true church. For how long? Three and a half years. They will be persecuted. They will persecute church. Why? Because they refined us. In order to produce the finery gold, the gold has to be put into a hot place to remove all this impurity from the gold. Once the gold is put into a hot place, and refined, then it's going to come out as the pure gold. God put us in the very difficult situations on purpose. For true believers, no matter what situations we're in, we always trust in the Lord. We come to the Lord, we ask the Lord to help. Instead of, oh, I can help myself. I can do everything by myself. If you can do it yourself, then you don't need God. Because we can't do everything. We have to rely on the Lord. Just like what I just explained it to you. For those are the people who's trying to restore the walls of Jerusalem. They had to carry the weapons on one side. They're ready to fight against them. But their confession said, war is on God, not on us. Not on our power, not on our, our weapons, not on our strategy. But God is the one who will fight for us. But who's the fighting on the ground? Israel is. We have to do our part. But at the same time, we have to trust the Lord. We have to rely on the Lord. We have to ask the Lord. This is true believers. And they're doing the exactly the same thing. In the time of a famine, it's a very difficult time for them to really just making a, a day lives. But they come and continue to rebuild the wall because they do know God wants to rebuild this wall of the Jerusalem. So verse 6 says, I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and officials. And I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother. And I held a great assembly against them and said to them, we, as far as we are able, have brought back our Jewish brothers who have been sold to the nations, but you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the things that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunt of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, 
I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. Return to them this very day their fields, their vineyard, their olives, uh, orchards, and their houses, and the per percentage of money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. Then they said, We will restore these and require nothing from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priest and made them swear to do as they had promised. I took, I also took out the fold of my garment and said, So may God shake out every man from his house and from his labor who does not keep the promise. So may he be shaken out and emptied. And all the assembly said, Amen, and praised the Lord, and the people did, uh, did as they had promised. When you look at the uh, book of Exodus and book of Leviticus, God told them not to really just to, you know, charge them more than what they should be doing. When they lend the money, do not put interest on it. And that is God's law. But how many people does know God's word? Not many. And therefore, they did what they think it's right. They want to just to take everything what they could. And for the richest people, they taking interest. And they're taking a lot more than what they're supposed to. And Jeremiah, uh, Nehemiah was upset with those people, the rich people, the noble people. And they said, we will not do what we've been doing. And how Nehemiah been doing? Verse 14 says, Moreover, from, that, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year of the 32nd year of Arthur Sersex, the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governors. The former governor who were before me laid a heavy burden on the people and took from them for their daily ration uh, 40 shekels of a silver. Even their servant lorded it over the people. Nehemiah, remember I told you that Arthur Sersex asked, like, how long you'll be gone? He said, 12 years. Even though Arthur Sersex wanted him to just to come back as soon as he could, it took 12 years for him to just restore the walls and then come back. Not just the restoring the walls, but at the same time governing and making sure that all the Israelites do what they're supposed to do. While he was a governor, he did not take anything from his own people or burden them, even though his previous governor did. What does that mean? Nehemiah was a very honest, pe honest person. He would not take anything from his own people. He barely just to get enough food for him and his family. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. He was very pure and honest guy. Why? Because he was a man of God. Verse 16, I also perserved in the work on this walls, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials beside those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now, what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice of sheep and birds and every ten days all kinds of wines in abundance. Yet for all this I did not demand the food allowance for the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, O oh my God, all that I have done for this people. Nehemiah, as I mentioned, he was very honest 
and he did, he did not take anything more than what he should take. He was just only taking what is necessary for him to do and just to do his work. Literally, nothing more, nothing less. Why? He was fearing the Lord and he did want to do something for the, God, for the Lord and for his people. We as a believer, we have to learn this. Not only Nehemiah was a pure and honest person, but at the same time, what can we do for the believers? We have to rely on the Lord, but we have to be generous and we have to be kind. We have to do what we need to do, not taking anything more than what we're supposed to, to our own people, to our church. And this is something we have to learn from Nehemiah. All right, so we're just going to cover up to chapter 5 today and then we'll try to just to try to wrap up the rest of the story in the coming week. <laughs>